Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's Pete coming to you from Oakland, California, the fourth stop of the Police Accountability Tour. Just got into town. Jacob and I just flew in yesterday from Cape Town, South Africa. We're out there for six weeks, the third stop of the Police Accountability Tour. Since it was my first time there, I just wanted to share some of my thoughts with you on the situation. Um, obviously, I'm not an expert, so I encourage you, if you have any interest, to you know look more into this yourself. What I can say with confidence is that almost no one trusts the police as an institution, and for good reason. The police in South Africa, like the police in any nation state, purport to provide protection and safety. But as is clear, those things can never come from an institution that's based on violence. The same year the latest disastrous iteration of the Fed came into existence here in the States, a few policing outfits consolidated to form the South African police. In the early 1940s, when some of those active with the National Party said that they had the right to control others within the arbitrary political boundary defined as South Africa, the police actively targeted those with a darker complexion. As they did so, they cited as justification text their colleagues had put on paper that they called legislation. During the apartheid era, the police targeted those deemed dissidents with counterinsurgency tactics, and at times, they worked in conjunction with their friends in the military. Clearly, the order being enforced wasn't that based on justice or equality. In 1994, the power perceived to exist within those who call themselves government shifted from the National Party to individuals active with the African National Congress, or ANC. The South African Police was transitioned into the South African Police Services, or SAPS, which had at its core a doctrine of community policing. Many were hopeful that the policing apparatus would be accountable to all, yet that hasn't exactly been delivered. Author Johnny Steinberg in Thin Blue, The Unwritten Rules of Policing in South Africa, described the situation during this time. Under apartheid, blacks and whites lived in parallel worlds. White people assumed that providing security was the role of the state. Black people knew that if they wanted security, they would have to acquire it themselves. The transition to democracy has spread the condition of insecurity from black people to white. And so, for the first time in the history of South African security, whites are starting to behave like blacks, abandoning the state as a failed protector. They are beginning to organize personal protection on open markets, out of ethnic solidarity, out of neighborliness. Many have erected walls, topped with razor wire and electrical fencing, around their property. Entry points were also hardened. Hardly a property exists where metal gates or bars don't cover the doors and windows. And the security business is booming. In the middle or well-off neighborhoods, vehicles promising armed response are much more common than our police vehicles. In the areas where folks don't have the means to contract for the provision of security, inhabitants take it upon themselves to police their neighborhoods. <laughs> Last year in the Western Cape, where Cape Town is located, one of nine provinces in South Africa, 80 people were killed due to vigilantism. Honestly, it's not surprising that many don't feel compelled to request help from the folks who steal their property under the guise of protecting them. Consider the treatment of Mido Masia. Masia was told by SAP's employees that his taxi was incorrectly parked. As journalist Retta Thalby noted, Masia dared to argue with the gods. He was handcuffed to the back of a police vehicle, dragged down the street, and later died from his injuries. In Cape Town's Central Business District, police employees could again be seen defaulting to heavy-handedness in their unjust treatment of Lunga Nuno Goodman, a blind busker. Those incidents are just two of an untold thousands that occur in South Africa. The reason that they are known is because bystanders chose to film. So while proactive patrols to document police actions isn't now too common, the opportunistic filming Recording if and when an incident unfolds is happening and it's gathering traction. Clearly, the police do not operate in a vacuum. The economic situation on the ground definitely has impact. Said R. W. Johnson, author of South Africa's Brave New World, the beloved country since the end of apartheid, whenever the ANC faced a choice between higher economic growth and strengthening control, it unhesitantly chose the latter. Cumulatively, this preference was to be a large cause of unemployment. Official figures put unemployment in South Africa at 25 percent, yet the real figure is likely higher. It's not surprising then that for many employed at SAPS, donning a badge isn't a calling, it's just a job. Similar to the treatment of Native Americans in the states, the forced relocation of peoples into the Cape Flats or townships, coupled with the muddling of property rights in decades past, has resulted in a reality today where many find themselves 
living in environments where infrastructure many consider basic, such as running water, flushing toilets, electricity, or waste removal, are lacking or non-existent. The failure to deliver those services, despite political campaigns promising such change, has resulted in protests, referred to as service delivery strikes. Andreas Tatiani, an activist spearheading calls for change, was killed at a service delivery strike after being beaten and shot with rubber bullets by SAP's employees. At an incident that became known as the Americana Massacre, SAP's employees injured over 70 and killed almost three dozen striking miners, many of whom had been shot in the back. Claims by police that they were just acting in defense were not seen as truthful by most. Thanks to the existence of video documentation of both of these incidents, millions are now aware of the police employing misdeeds. Big surprise then that recent surveys have indicated that over 80% of people believe the police corrupt. A big part of that corruption is spawned by drug prohibition. History and economics both show that merely dictating that a good or service in demand is banned only drives its supply underground. Whether it's cannabis or DACA as it's called in South Africa, tick, a methamphetamine made with rat poison and other chemicals, or any other substance said to be prohibited, drug prohibition brings about a lucrative drug trade which has given rise to gangsterism and perhaps more than anything else fuels a widespread corruption of SAP's employees. In her 2013 book, Crossing the Line, When Cops Become Criminals, which focused on SAPs, Lisa Grobler noted that the extent of crime and corruption in the police is difficult to measure, but the experts and the offenders say it ranges from pretty bad to huge. Drug-related and gang-related crimes are the most prevalent. In fact, 90% of Cape Flats residents believe police corrupt and in cohorts with gangs. Those involved with Packard, people against gangsterism and drugs, who view the police as inept to handle the problems, have targeted and slain dozens of gang leaders. Yet because of the enormous profits to be made thanks to drug prohibition, it's had little effect on gangsterism as others have stepped up to fill the void. The insidious relationship between gangsters and police employees continues, not because it's unknown, but because those involved have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, which is supported by the fact that attempts to address corruption within SAPs have been ignored, deflected, or stymied by ANC lackeys. Two outfits tasked with rooting out corruption, the Directorate of Special Operations and the Anti-Corruption Unit were both shut down because they revealed the culture of corruption within SAPs. Also telling is that the last two police commissioners were forced to step down after their own corruption and misdeeds came to light. Currently, over 1,500 SAPs employees have criminal records, and last year over 1,300 were charged with crimes, including corruption, fraud, aiding an escapee, defeating the ends of justice, extortion, rape, and murder, and over 900 died when in police custody. As Johnson noted, few would have guessed in 1994 that the police would soon be worse than ever, that police torture would be worse than under apartheid, and that far more prisoners would die in police custody. Yet the government treated such facts with complete unconcern, emphasizing how far the struggle had merely replaced one selfish elite by another. Instead of working to clean house, police handlers have peddled a get-tough-on-crime rhetoric, including the 2010 restructuring of SAPs to a military hierarchy. SAPs employs roughly 160,000 as police. From early 2004 until 2011, they lost in total over 20,000 firearms. It's believed that the bulk were transferred for a fee into the hands of those involved with gangsterism. Many outside the SAPs police apparatus and the ANC politicking have called for a complete retooling of SAPs. So we, we, we literally are at a crossroads. But the SAPs folks and their handlers have become less transparent. In recent years, SAPs employees have had to sign agreements stating that they not personally talk with the media. All communication is now directed to a select few spin doctors who tout the official line. After an incident in downtown Cape Town, when I was detained for 20 minutes and my video footage was deleted by Dave Ruja, a local journalist who followed up was told by police spokesperson Andre Trout that while filming of the police isn't illegal, it could become illegal if the police take someone into custody. Jacob and I made numerous attempts to get a police spokesperson on record about policy related to filming the police, including emails, phone calls, and in-person visits, yet we were never responded to. That includes individual constables on the street, sector commanders in their office, Arno Lamore, the provincial commissioner of Western Cape, and the media center for SAPs. As for Andre Trout, who had seemed never balked at talking with the mainstream media, he told us, I will absolutely not be doing an interview with you. I was later told, off the record by a police employee, that SAPS has no policy related to the filming of the police, and thus the default to hostility when it is seen. That was certainly the reaction I saw every time I filmed in Cape Town. Uh, don't, 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 don't do that. Well, we have, the, we have the right to film here. Ah, uh -uh, you've got no right to do that. Yes, 
This is well, a... you've got no right to do that. I will confiscate this camera. Yeah, I'm curious to hear what's going on tonight. What, excuse Thank me. Thank you. Come with me. What Hello. Are, Come with me. Captain. How are you? Captain. Sir, uh, I have a right to film. I've put videos from Captain. Yeah, yeah. I have a right to film, sir. Yeah, no, no, no. I have a right to film. This is a, this is a public space. Yeah, yeah, he just, no, no, we just no. But, but why? Yeah, why are you filming? Oh, we just saw you guys doing it. We just we're just checking and to make sure everything's okay. Over yeah, there, sir, sir, this is my. Yeah. Pro so what's the solution? To plead with those in the ANC and Saps to change to alter some text on paper conflated to be law? How has that worked? The biggest positive game changer happens from bottom-up actions. As video-enabled phones and the internet spread, opportunistic filming will increase, then the proactive filming of police, then eventually we can move past that to a world free from institutionalized violence. Will filming police solve everything? No, but filming police will lessen heavy-handedness as would-be aggressors are deterred. Filming police will maximize accountability as an objective record of actions is captured. And ultimately, filming police will accelerate positive changes as situations become known globally and people realize the failures inherent of top-down central bureaucracies based on force and look to alternatives.